John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The American Revolution, 1776. We're taught in our history books that the colonists, the brave men of Massachusetts and New York and Virginia and the other colonies rise up in the Continental Congress, 74, 75, and speak back to their crown, speak back to the cabinet and say, no tyranny, no taxation without representation, no tyranny, we cannot stand this. And they eventually de declare independence, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution follows many years later. That's the American side of the story. The English side of the story, the British, the parliamentary side of the story, in a new book, a wonderful discovery for me, An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. Nick Bunker is the author. He's with me now. Nick, wholehearted congratulations. And we begin with the mysterious and wonderful story. It is February 1772. We're off Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Cape Cod, there is an English officer. His name is Christie. He works with another English officer, Duddington. Both men are charged with stopping smuggling. Mr. Christie intercepts a boat. He believes is in, in, is in the practice of running past the, uh, the excise uh, uh, costs, the, t the, 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 the stamps that must be bought to, to import molasses or rum or tea, most importantly, because we're headed for the tea, the, uh, the tea Party of 1773. Christie takes the boat into a, uh, a, a, a port for the night. It happens to be a place that we now know as Vinyl Haven on Martha's Vineyard. He takes it there, and he's challenged over these next hours by men wearing Indian costumes. Who are they, and why do they do that? Good evening to you, Nick. Hello there. It's excellent, John. Glad to be with you. Who are these men, and why are they wearing Indian costumes? Well, let's just st take a step backwards, first of all. Uh, now, the reason why these British naval officers were there off the coast was because they had received intelligence reports from the Netherlands, uh, from Europe, to the effect that there was a great flood of smuggled tea about to arrive in America. So that's why they were off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, looking for the smuggled tea. In addition to that... They already knew that the coast of Martha's Vineyard, Buzzards Bay, Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, that whole area was a hotbed of smuggling. So they were expecting to find smugglers, and they were hoping to arrest them. Now, when they got to Vineyard Haven, what happened was this. Now, Christie and his men had impounded um, a ship full of, of smuggled rum and molasses from the West Indies. They were hoping to take it back to Boston, because that was the local headquarters of the British Royal Navy. They were hoping to take this ship back to Boston where it would be searched and, and seized and uh, where the, uh, the master and his crew could be prosecuted. But what happened at Vineyard Haven was that uh, as they were sitting off the coast with, with the snow falling and it was very cold, obviously it was wintertime, they were ambushed by this group, uh, as you say, of, of men dressed as Indians. Uh, they were dumped into a little, into a little boat and made to row off back to the shore. The following morning, uh, Lieutenant Dunnington turned up in a Royal Navy schooner, discovered what had happened, and, uh, made, and tried to chase the, uh, the smugglers who were responsible. There was a kind of a firefight that followed on the shore at Vineyard Haven. Now, both sides backed off from a full-scale confrontation, that is to say that the smugglers on the land and the Royal Navy on their other hand. But the effect of this little incident in February of 1772 was to convince the British Royal Navy that... Uh, an epidemic of smuggling was occurring along the coast, and they needed to take very severe measures to put an end to it. And this led to a period of several months of, of fairly angry confrontations between the Navy and the people of Rhode Island and Martha's Vineyard. And that had some fairly fateful consequences in the summer of 1772. A very fateful consonant, uh, consequences. Duddingston is doing his duty. He works for Admiral, Vice Admiral Montague, who commands the British Navy, the Royal Navy in America. He doesn't have a great number of ships. However, he is a man who does his duty. He's related to uh, Montague on the cabinet, who are the, uh, the first lord of the admiralty, uh, Earl of Sandwich. However, Montague is, uh, has charged Duddingston to interrupt the smuggling route. It's important now to note that this took place in Rhode Island, not in Massachusetts. Rhode Island had a what you'd have to say, discontinuous understanding of its obligations to the crown as a colony. 
There was a man named Hopkins. He was the chief judge. He was the big political actor in Newport. Hopkins believed that the parliament could only pass laws that the people agreed with. You've taught me here, Nick, that that's not accurate, that he invented that understanding and that when Parliament passed laws to tax, such as tea, or to tax anything into America, if the locals didn't agree with it, was it Hopkins' opinion that they didn't have to obey? Well, let's look at it from Hopkins' point of view for a moment, the American point of view. Now, you see, Rhode Island had always been a bit of an anomaly within the British Empire because they had a charter that had been granted by Charles II, King Charles II, back in the 1660s, which had given Rhode Island a very free and liberal form of government. And the charter of Rhode Island was a bit ambiguous. The language of the charter could be read in different ways. And the way Hopkins read it, the Chief Justice read it, was he read it to say that if a law was passed in Rhode Island and it conflicted with a law that was passed in London, then the locals in Rhode Island had the right on their side, that their interpretation should prevail. That was the way he saw things. And quite frankly, within the Charter of Rhode Island, because the language is a bit ambiguous, you can see where he was coming from. Now we go However, to... Yes, go on, please continue. Yeah, but put it this way. Once Hopkins had arrived at that kind of opinion... It was only a matter of time, frankly, before he became fully independent. But Chief Justice Hopkins, who he was, he was a he was he was quite an original thinker. Uh, but he developed ideas that eventually were bound to lead to independence. No question about that. And June, the yeah. Duddingston again is at, at at his work on the Gaspé. This is a, a Royal Navy schooner, the Gaspé, tracing smugglers. He chases yeah. one group of smugglers into a cove, and he runs aground. And they spend the night waiting to be floated off by the tide. Again, they're approached by men never named at, the, at that moment who overwhelm them. Shots are fired. Duddingston is wounded and he surrenders his boat, Gaspé, which is then destroyed. The men are taken off. The Royal Navy men are taken off and they're put ashore. This, Nick, you've taught me, is the reason the American Revolution follows in the sequence of 1773, the Tea Party, 1774, the, the, uh, the Continental Congress, 1775, uh, Paul Revere rides. It's because of Gaspé. And you've also taught me that it, Gaspé was on the minds of all the major governances in London at the time. Everybody knew about Gaspé. That's right. Now, American historians do mention the Gaspé incident. They do talk about it. It features in American history books. But they tend to treat it as, as, as just a riot. They tend to treat it as something that was violent, that something that was, it, was, it was a riot, it was, something, it was a piece of disorder, but they don't see it as a fundamentally important part of the lead-up towards the revolution. Now, that's not the way the British government saw it at the time. The British government were extremely upset about the Gaspé incident because what had occurred was this, a flagrant attack on a Royal Navy vessel in American waters doing its legal duty, sunk and destroyed by a group of Americans. And the thing that annoyed the British most of all was they knew who was responsible. It was the Browns of Rhode Island, the people who founded Brown University in due course, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Now, the British knew who had done it, but, of course, they couldn't prove it because nobody would come forward and testify in court on oath against the Browns who were responsible. And that was what made the British so upset. I mean, the British Attorney General at the time, for example, a man called Thurlow, he was the most senior legal official in the British government, he said it was five times worse than the riots against the Stamp Act. But the trouble was the British felt impotent because they couldn't find anyone to testify in a court of law. But it fed this kind of festering resentment right. inside the British government that led them in due course after the Boston Tea Party to take the kind of uh, very coercive steps that they did to try and bring New England back into the fold. We're, let's go to London now. We're going into the cabinet meetings of the North government. Lord North is the prime minister. King George III sits on the crown, but ever since the revolution of the previous century, the king rules at the permission of parliament. And so we must, we must involve ourselves into parliamentary affairs to understand Empire on the Edge, how Britain came to fight America. Nick Bunker is the author. I'm John Batchelor.
I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Nick Bunker is here to tell a wonderful story to me of the American Revolution from the British point of view, the parliamentary point of view. And the gas bay is on the minds of everyone in cabinet. As they hear about it, remember there's some five, six, can be eight weeks delay for information to flow from that si- from the American side of the Atlantic to London. Depends on the time of year. However, when they do hear about it, Lord North immediately moves to start an investigation. What can be done? The cabinet itself is important because this is a cabinet that has inherited fixed conflicts with America. Nick, we begin with the cabinet under Grenville, Lord Pitt the Elder. That was the 1765 Stamp Act. That was repealed under uh, the Parliament of Rockingham. I believe Marquess of Rockingham was the Prime Minister when they repealed it, and they put in its place the Townsend Acts. At the same time, they put in something called the Declaratory Act. I'm mentioning all this because it becomes part of the writ that America holds against Britain and Britain's frustration with America because it keeps compromising They compromised on the Stamp Act, and here they are seven years later, having backed off on the original Stamp Act, and the Gaspé strikes them as vindicating those who said, if you make concessions, it will get worse. Was that what was said in Parliament when they heard about Gaspé? Well, actually, there's very little debate in Parliament about Gaspé, because the Gaspé incident happened in June. Ah. Now, the problem in Britain was that Parliament used to rise in June, then it didn't come back again until December or January. So in practice, Parliament didn't really talk very much about Gatsby incident, but the cabinet officials, the government officials, were very upset about it indeed. They saw it, as you rightly say, as a vindication of the view that always held, which is that if you compromise with Americans, Americans would simply ask for more and more. Now, the problem really at this point was that the British felt exasperated with what they felt was colonial intransigence. Uh, They believed they had acted reasonably. They weren't taxing America very hard, actually. I mean, the total tax revenue for America was actually pretty trivial. And one of the reasons why Lord North was upset about the gas bill was because he'd also heard the same time he'd had a a series of accounts given to him by the uh, the cashier for the colonies showing that no tax revenues had arrived from America for months and months and months. So no money was coming over from the colonies. And then here were the colonists destroying the gas bay, which was uh, in order to frustrate any customs revenue being gathered at all. So from the British point of view, it was all becoming a rather impossible situation. The colonists clearly weren't paying any taxes. They were refusing to pay any taxes. It was becoming, frankly, impossible. uh, The details here are striking. The estimate was that it cost £400,000 per year to yes. maintain the colonies. That's the army, the fleet, the governance. It's essentially the army and the navy. Right, and they, the, the taxes from America, which they were complaining about, were £47,000 <laughs> per right. year. It was what I said. Now, you, if, if you wanted to be generous towards the colonists, you would include the tax revenue that collected in Great Britain from the tobacco that was imported, which is about another £200,000. But frankly, it, the reality is that The cost of of running the colonies and managing them and spending the money on the army and the navy was far in excess of the taxes that were actually collected. So, yeah, uh, to be honest, the the, the British government was spending a lot of money on running the empire and not getting very much. Let's go into the cabinet because I'll go through them quickly and you'll speak. Are they for for, uh, using a strong hand against America or against it? North, first of all, a mysterious man a master of tactics. You present him in Parliament, a man who is self-effacing. He calls himself and his wife ugly at the same time that he's extremely well-spoken. He's a major Latinist. The king likes him a lot. In fact, the king socializes with him. Is he for or against a a hard hand with the colonies? Well, the problem with North was this. Now, North was, as you say, a very, very talented politician. He was a very witty man, he was a very funny man, he was very popular with his colleagues, he was a very good manager of people. But he was a politician, not a statesman. He was very good at managing politics from day to day and week to week, but he wasn't very good at having a long-term vision. He wasn't a statesman, in other words. Uh, Now, what that meant was that he never really had a kind of long-term vision about where he wanted to get to with America. So that North tended to vacillate. If the king felt he wanted to take a strong line with America, North would feel he wanted to take a strong line. The rest of the time, North essentially wished the American situation would go away. All right, well, let's move on to the cabinet. We'll come back to North. Uh, then there's the Earl of Rochford, 54 years old, and you say that his views are shaped by the 1745 rising oh, yes. of Bonnie Prince Charlie. So he is he a strong hand or a weak hand? 
Well, that's a terribly important point. You see, there was an older generation of men in the British government, like Lord Rochford, like Lord Sandwich, whose views had been shaped entirely by the experience of the 1740s when Britain had been a war against France and when Britain had been a war in, in Scotland against the Jacobite rebels. Now, these were men who t tended to take a hard line about everything because they tended to remember a time when Britain had been in great danger. And they, they wanted to crush any aspect of rebellion wherever it might be, whether it was in Ireland, whether it was in Scotland, or whether it was in America. Now, they, therefore, would always tend to be more severe and more disciplinarian than North himself. North was a bit of a compromiser. He was a politician. These men like Rochford and his colleagues, the older generation, tended to be much tougher. So in that, that would be Montague as well, the Earl of Sandwich. He yeah, would be right. strong-handed. They were much tougher in their right. attitudes, any kind of disciplinary. It was expected of you that you would be generous and you would spend lots of money to maintain an opulent lifestyle. Right. And therefore, the British, the British aristocracy in the 18th century were chronically and always in debt up to their eyeballs. We'll come to the debt crisis of the whole continent uh, soon enough, but I, uh, just two other figures you mentioned. Uh, Gower and Suffolk. Who, Suffolk dies at 40. He's a hard worker. Gower, he's Lord President of the Privy Council. Are they strong-handed or do they sit back? Oh, yes. Yes, they were. Uh, Gower was a very, very rich man indeed. And being a very rich man, he felt free to express his opinions as forcibly as he possibly could. He was an extremely powerful character because he commanded about 30 or 40 seats in Parliament. Right. And he always tended to push Lord North towards very hard line whatever policy that he was in favour of. Suffolk, Lord Suffolk, who was the, one of the foreign secretaries, he was one of the men in charge of Britain's foreign policy, he was a very hard-working individual. He was a very talented young man. But again, he, was, he, he tended to take a very hard line towards America. The, 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 one of the difficulties was that all these men had, had already, at the time of the Stamp Act, got up in the House of Lords, the upper chamber of the British Parliament, and had made very forceful statements about the need to bring America back into line, about the need to, to take a very hard line over the Stamp Act rights. Now, having said those things, having got up in the House of Lords and made speeches saying that America needed to be brought to heel. It was very hard for them to change tack. It was very hard for them to backtrack from these very forceful statements they'd made. One more, Hillsborough, he's colonial secretary. He's about to leave because of the controversy over expanding the colonies past the Ap Appalachian Mountains. Yes. And, and he falls out with everyone, and he's to be replaced by Dartmouth. The exit of Hillsborough and the entrance of Lord Dartmouth at this point is just one of those pieces of fate, I read, Nick, that means that the policies are, uh, they're ambiguous, they're, and they're regarded as ambiguous in America when they hear the letters. That's right. Well, now, Hillsborough, I think, is a man who has been very unfairly treated by historians. Now, he was, there's no question that Hillsborough was a very tough individual. I mean, he really did believe that the Americans should be brought, he believed at the time of the Stamp Act that the army should have been sent to Boston to crush uh, what he thought of as a rebellion. Uh, just a moment, Nick. We'll continue with uh, Hillsborough crushing the, the rebellion. An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. Nick Bunker is the author. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I interrupted Nick Bunker, who's telling of his wonderful new book. This is a discovery for those of us who've been educated from the American point of view about the American Revolution, An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. I interrupted Nick when he was telling about Her Hillsborough, who was colonial secretary over this accidental empire that included the 13 colonies. About 2 million people. Britain at this point is a population of about 11 million people. But it's the misapprehension and misunderstanding that is the mystery here. Please continue about Hillsborough, Nick. Well, Hillsborough was probably the most hated man in America in the early 1770s. I mean, particularly in Boston. The, the Bostonians really loathed Hillsborough. 
the great thing about Hillsborough, though, is that his great saving grace was that he was consistent. Everybody knew where he stood. Hillsborough had a very clear view about what he wanted to happen. Hillsborough believed that Americans were inherently rebellious. He believed that they should be prevented from expanding westwards across the Appalachians because he believed that if they did so, they would cause a war with the Indians. So Hillsborough had a very clear set of policies that he wanted to follow. The trouble was that when Hillsborough was essentially fired in 1772 by the British government, what happened then was a kind of vacuum of policy. Here you had a man who was very clear in his ideas, and he was replaced by Lord Dartmouth, who wasn't clear at all. If Hillsborough had stayed on, at least everybody would have known where they stood. But with Lord Dartmouth, who was a, a bit of a, a rather weaker individual, of course, it all became rather vague and ambiguous. And that kind of vagueness and ambiguity was what led, frankly, to the Boston Tea Party. Yes, and Dartmouth will mention here, you make him a mysterious fellow because he's an early Methodist and yeah. practices a nonconformism that would have, uh, would have raised the eyebrows of many of those at court. And yet he and North socialize with the king. The couples are companionable. Well, you see, in writing the book, I have to say that the, the one character that in many ways I liked the most, and the character I found most interesting and most sympathetic was Lord Dartmouth. Dartmouth was, a, in many ways, an admirable character. William Legge, the second Lord Dartmouth. Uh, he was an evangelical Christian. He was a very sincere Christian. He wasn't, this wasn't hypocrisy, it wasn't pretense. He sincerely was a, a believing Christian, a, a born-again Christian, we would say today, he supported members of the of the clergy. He was an early abolitionist. He sat on the board of hospitals. He gave real money away. He was very sincerely believing Christian. The problem was that his Christianity really sort of let him down here. What Dharma tried to do was to try and reconcile himself to people like Samuel Adams. He tried to reach out to the, in Boston, to the colonists in Boston in 1773 and then again in 1774. He tried to go to Benjamin Franklin. He tried over and over again to try and reach some kind of accommodation. But the difficulty was that although he was a, a very kind and generous man, he was also a very conservative person. He didn't really understand how people felt in, in New England at the time. He couldn't really understand the attitude of a, of a farmer in Virginia or Massachusetts who simply rejected the authority that he represented. And that was his problem. His Christianity was kind of ambiguous. On one hand, he was a loving evangelical Christian. On the other hand, he was also a very conservative and authoritarian person. It, it comes to me that it's important to flag at this point, none of these men had ever been to the colonies. They, no, are, they are governing an idea. Right. They are governing an empire, and they're looking at all of it, not the colonies specifically. We're about to turn to India, for example, or the rest of the possessions yeah. of the commercial empire. So everything they say about America is based upon correspondence. That's the only experience they have. Well, this is one of the most extraordinary aspects of Britain in the 18th century. That if, if you think about Britain in the 18th century, we had some really great people in Britain in the 18th century, great thinkers, great writers. Dr. Johnson, the philosopher David Hume, Adam Smith, the economist. Gibbon, Edmund Gibbon, Burke. Gibbon writing The Empire at the Time, The Fall of the Empire at the Time, yes. None of them ever went to America. And it wasn't that difficult, you know, actually. It wasn't difficult. If you were living in Glasgow, for example, where Adam Smith lived, actually, to get to America was really quite easy. It would only take you about six weeks there and six weeks back. But it never occurred to any of them to actually go on a boat to go over there. It's quite extraordinary, really. And, and that is a really quite a sad reflection on the, on, on the way Britain was run at the time. Let's turn to Britain run at the time. Remember, these are the men, these are the important members of cabinet who set the themes for the parliament when it meets and on generally are administering the departments. We've mentioned yeah. the colonial department. We'll come to that specifically. But coming at this same time, it's just one of those perfect storms. I meet them all the time now, Nick, in history. It's the way it's what explains change. The markets in 1772 experience a crisis driven per, in part by drought, in part by massive immigration from Ireland and from Scotland to Americas and everywhere else, and then a bank run. You, you tell the thrilling story of a bank run by, uh, l triggered by a man named Forndice, who okay, never yeah. paid his bills and lived lavishly and uh, then absconded when he knew that he couldn't pay his bills. And banks were falling not just in London, but in Scotland and then on the continent. You tell a story of men who not only lived beyond their means, they were outright pirates from the 21st century point of view. But at the time, they were the new men, weren't they, Nick? These were the ones who weren't lords and ladies. They'd invented themselves with commerce. 
Well, actually, you know, it, it's always been a fundamental feature of Great Britain that Great Britain has always had a very big banking and financial sector relative to the rest of the economy. I mean, this goes back to the 17th century. That Britain, it's a bit like New York. You know, London, New York have this kind of strange similarity to each other. We have the very big banking and financial sector, much bigger than it really ought to be. But as you say, yes, there was in the 1760s and 17th centuries. There were 1770s. There was a kind of an enormous speculative financial boom. There was a very free and easy banking culture, and there was indeed a huge banking crash in 1772 that nearly brought Britain to its knees. And the and res- the response, yeah. the response oh, yeah, was part of the anxiety for North. He was. Ne- you present yeah. Lord North is he's a compelling figure because he's never happy. He always feels inadequate, and he's always writing his father about how he's not up to the job. That's right. Which is probably what you would find about many modern politicians. I mean, I would suspect that if we saw the private correspondence of many modern politicians who were confronted with the financial crisis of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you would see the same kind of thing. To be honest they probably feel they're out of their depth. But North certainly fell out of his depth because he was, he was dealing with a banking crisis and a country that was in the grip, remember, of the origins of the Industrial Revolution. Right. You know, got to bear in mind, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a country, Great Britain, that was in the very, at the very beginning of the great Industrial Revolution that would transform the world. And that Industrial Revolution created all kinds of stresses and strains and tensions which they didn't really understand. They knew something was happening. They knew something profound was changing in their world. They didn't know exactly what it was, and I think that was the real problem with Lord North, that he couldn't quite work out what was going on, but he knew something was going on, and it, and, and it, and it didn't seem quite right. Adam Smith is studying this period. He will publish That's his right. book in That's 1776, right. so he's describing a world of markets that driven exactly by right. three commodities. There will eventually be yeah. the fourth commodity of cotton, but that's not for another 20 years. The three commodities were tobacco, sugar, and uh, uh, rum or molasses or, or at this point tea. Those three. Now, the fact is, Nick makes it very clear to me, no one who is not English understands the obsession with tea. Apparently, <laughs> the continent certainly didn't enjoy it in any way or near the extent yeah. the English did at this point. And it's, and it's the joy of your book, Nick, to discover that tea is not an incidental part of the Tea Party of 1773. Yeah. This describes the failure of of the East India Company's books at that moment in 1772, and we need to introduce the East India Company. You, you describe a world, East India House, that is still available for scholars such as yourself. All of the records are written down to the penny in red leather bound books. But it was a new thing, wasn't it? East India Company, the idea that you could buy shares and get wealthy on the prospects of this commodities trading business around the world that dealt all the way to China, all the way to India, and then anywhere else they felt like. They were, uh, uh, the impression you give me is that they're outside of the reach of government and that cabinet is not happy about this. No, the British government weren't actually very happy about the East India Company. Now, they wanted Britain to have a huge business overseas. I mean, they wanted Britain to be powerful in India, and they wanted Britain to control the tea from China, but they were very happy about the East India Company because they felt that the East India Company's directors and shareholders were devious and corrupt men who might, in due course, bring the nation to its knees. Now, and that was, to some extent, that was true. You see, the East India Company wasn't actually necessarily owned by the British. Uh, 30% of the shares of the East India Company were actually owned by the Dutch, by Dutch pension funds and Dutch investors. A lot of the East India Company stock was owned by widows and orphans because it was regarded as being a way to fund annuities and pensions and so forth. The British government itself felt the East India Company was actually a rather dangerous enterprise, and they were worried about the fact that one day it might go horribly wrong. They were right to be worried. And, well, and in fact, <laughs> in fact you say that the king, the king hated the thing, and Rochefort himself yeah, said, yeah. He, he, he said, damn to the yeah. East India That's Company. Right. And, but there were 50 members of parliament who bought the stock. So it wasn't owned by everybody, but North had to pay attention to those members because they were going to vote in favor of East India Company. So when its bills came due and they couldn't pay them, there's going to be a run on all the banks. The government has enough money to step in. But as you, you make the case that they didn't have they didn't have CNBC television, they didn't have the BBC, they didn't have Bloomberg all the time telling them of what the markets are. They had to do a lot of guessing as to how they can actually save the East India Company without wrecking the empire. Well, that's the point. I and mean, the East India Company was essentially the general motors of its day. I mean, 
you know, General Motors is not the best run company in the world, and nobody would really want necessarily to save it. But the trouble is, if General Motors goes completely bankrupt, what happens to America? That's the issue. Now, at the time, I mean, to be frank, they might have allowed the East India Company to go bust, but they were frightened of doing so. So they had to do something to try and keep it going. And what they tried to do was to find a way of getting them rid of all this vast amount of tea the East India Company had brought back right, to them right, right. from China and ship it over to America, which seemed to be the most logical thing. You're, you're build, you build a case that the harbors are filling with tea chests yeah, arriving yeah, from, oh, uh, oh, from oh. China, and they've got more and more on their books. It's worth a lot of money. However, the smugglers, yeah. we're going to tell the story of the smugglers when we come back. The book is An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. Nick Bunker is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. Nick Bunker's An Empire on the Edge is the story of, from the Parliament's point of view, the frustrations with the whole world, not just America, in the year 1772, leading to decisions that would create the conditions for the revolution, for the clash, for the violence, for the breakaway, and eventually for the aggrandizement of both the new American Republic and the English Empire. However, at this point, everybody's in a fog of diplomacy and bad books, very bad books on the East India Company's part. Nick, take, Nick Bunker takes us into the fact that the East India Company had been living in a speculative bubble ever since a man named Robert Clive moved into India, that's the East India part of the book. And also, tea, the tea trade had exploded from the 1760s until now, the 1772. And Nick, I don't want to be reductionist about this, but in reading the, the saga of tea, it seems to me now, since I've read Adam Smith, a simple story of supply and demand. There, there was no way to maintain the market rising forever when the public was swimming in tea. In addition, the smugglers of the continent and the smugglers in America could take advantage of avoiding the tax put on tea by simply ignoring the gas bay or getting past it. And that was happening on the continent at the same time. But the East India Company didn't have a way of policing its own, uh, its own wealth. And so that's why all this tea built up, and they didn't know what to do with it. It was a simple matter. They had too much supply, and they didn't know how to solve it. Well, what happened, towards the end of 1772, there were all kinds of debates that went on in London about what to do with the fact that the East India Company all, had all this tea that it couldn't sell. Now, they had vast amounts of tea filling the warehouses all over London. And if you ever come to London these days, and you ever go down to the Tower of London, in that whole area around the Tower of London was full of warehouses at that time, but they were absolutely bursting with tea. Now, what do they do about it? Now... It, at that time, the London newspapers were very, very vocal and very, very active. And so the newspapers were full of debate about what to do about this tea stuff. And the logical thing to do, of course, was to try and to slash the price and to try and ship it overseas. And that was what was suggested. That was the logical thing to do. Now, what Lord North and the Treasury, the British Treasury Department, came up with was this, like, curious scheme, which was this. They thought, OK, what we'll do is... We'll send it over to America, and we'll do that for four reasons. One reason is this. If we ship it over to America, first of all, we'll get lots of cash to bail out the East India Company, which is nearly bankrupt. Okay. Secondly, we'll get some tax revenue, because the t when the tea goes over to America, it'll carry a, a, a tax of threepence a pound, and we'll get some tax revenue. So that's reason number two. Reason number three is we'll put the smugglers out of business because what we'll do is we'll flood the American market with cheap tea from the East India Company and the smugglers can't compete. And the fourth reason for sending the stuff over there, according to Lord North, was because this will establish a principle. The principle that will be established will be this, that any tea that's bought in America will carry a tax imposed by Great Britain. So those are the four reasons for sending the tea over there to America. And so it seemed to Lord North this was kind of a foolproof plan. 
but of course it all went horribly wrong. Yes, and before we get to how badly it ha- how badly it played in America, we have to introduce because <laughs> Nick, another one of the joys of your book is to discover how very small the government in London was at this point. Very, very small. And we're now going to the Colonial Department. And this is wonderful, because Nick takes us into what you feel is you've wandered into a Dickens story. And it's not quite Chancery Court. It's it's closer to Marley and Scrooge. There's just one fellow there riding away. In this case, there are two fellows. There's a man named John Pownall and a man named William Knox, who has the great recommendation is the, that Knox has actually been to America. He actually knows yeah. what he's talking about. That's all the department. That's the colonial department to administer all of the colonies, not just America. But at this point, let's focus on America because that's where the trouble is. This is now 1772 coming into 1773. There are 30 colonies. 25 of them have parliaments, their own legislatures. And their governors in each instance that are appointed by the, nominally by the crown, but by parliament. And there's no coordination whatsoever. There's no cooperation. There's no thinking about having a viceroy. None of that. It's administered a catch as catch can. And I guess that's the way everybody liked it until the crisis. Well, it's a bit like America today, really, in many ways. I mean, I mean to be honest, I mean... The way that Britain ran the colonies is a bit like the way that Texas and so on run themselves today, don't you think? Uh, well, except for the fact that we actually have the data. For example, the, the, <laughs> the, the, part, they, the <laughs> colonial department, Nick tells us, sends out a questionnaire. This, I think, is the end of 72, right, yeah. or early 73. They send a questionnaire to each of these governances, and the three important ones are Massachusetts, <laughs> Hutchinson, <laughs> Uh, New York, Tryon, and Virginia, Dunmore. Those three colonies will be the three, those are the three populous colonies that will rise up in the revolution in, a, in two years' time. They send them a questionnaire, and the first yeah. question is, where is your colony? Nick! That's, that's, I mean, that, is, that is indeed correct. But what, the reason they were doing that, though, was, it was quite a sensible reason, because they, what they were worried about was the boundary disputes, because the colonies were always arguing between each other about where your boundary was. I mean, North Carolina would argue about where its boundary was with Virginia or Maryland or whatever. And that was the reason they sent the questionnaire out, because they want to try and resolve these boundary disputes between the colonies. But it is indeed the case, yes, they want to know where is your colony. Right. And what is your population? What revenue? Yeah, what kind right, of yeah, governance you have? Yeah. So we're not, talking about, uh, we're not talking about anything that describes a tyranny. And that's, that's really what yeah. is exciting about your book, Nick. Once I peek inside the Chancery Court, or in this case, the Colonial Department, I think to myself, Tom Jefferson, you didn't know very much about the government well, that, that you were breaking yeah, I, away from. Yeah, I, well, I think that's right. I mean, they were, the, the, British, the British Colonial Office had about, well, I, I'm just looking down the book. I mean, basically, they had the, the entire Colonial Office Department was had about uh, 35 staff, and most of them never turned up for work at all. The actual number of clerks who actually worked in the Colonial Department was about seven, and they didn't really work long hours. And um, so you can imagine, it wasn't, it wasn't what you might call a huge bureaucratic tyranny. It wasn't, you're not talking about Soviet Russia here. Uh, a detail here, because we're going to turn to the Americans hearing this story about tea, yeah. is that the idea that Nick has laid out for Lord North to send the tea to America to get all these different uh, benefits from it did not come from Colonial Department. Nick, you argue that it came from the Treasury Department. It was their idea. Oh, yes. I mean, no question. It's one of the most extraordinary aspects of this story, that the tea was sent by Lord North and the Treasury and the East India Company without the Colonial Department even knowing that it had gone. And it is absolutely bizarre. Well, it, it's quite extraordinary, but that is the case, yes. I mean, there was no real plan uh, to... to, to yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Nor did they have a plan B, nor did they have anything no, to... Uh, nor did they that, anticipate that, that, that there, there would be no more... plan B. Yes, that is exactly. Let's just send the tea over there, and then we'll pay all the, all, <laughs> we'll pay all the, the debts we owe, and the, we'll, yeah, the colonies will have been punished, yeah, and exactly, we'll, yeah. yes, we'll impose. The book is An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. It's time now to turn from uh, laughing about the... the the very small government in London to how it was perceived, especially in America, as they come up with this scheme to send tea. I'm John Batchelor with Nick Bunker. This is The John Batchelor Show.